Hello, I am your host, Dr. Jack Braha, and welcome to the show. Here we will feature local community physicians who are experts in their field and who will share with us their expertise and experience with us. I hope to ask the same questions that you would ask your doctor. Today we have Dr. Kasum Viswanathan, a pediatric hematologist oncologist at One Brooklyn Health System at Brookdale Hospital. Welcome to the show, Dr. Viswanathan. It's really nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Tell, tell us first a little bit about yourself so our, our viewers can get to know you a bit better. Okay, so I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist, so I take care of children with blood diseases and cancer. So my training was really in pediatrics, and then I did a three, uh, at that time it was a two-year fellowship in pediatric hematology oncology, and I joined Brookdale in 1986. So this is my 35th year as a faculty member at Brookdale, uh, taking care of this uh, community. So to me, my passion is this community. I love taking care of my patients. It's nice to be in the same community for decades and watch it evolve. Yes. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself before medicine. Where are you from and where did you study? So I grew up in, in India, in Bombay and Delhi. And I went to medical school at uh, an excellent medical school called the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. And uh, soon, as soon as I finished, I actually um, always wanted to do pediatrics. It so happened I got married, so I came here, and my husband was a physician in Brooklyn. So we, um, I came to Brooklyn and started my residency at Long Island College Hospital, and subsequently did a fellowship in pediatric hemoc, and here I am. I continue to stay in Brooklyn. So you've, you've been here the entire time. Thanks Brooklyn, to your husband. Thanks to my husband, and both of us are in the same institute, you know, in the, in the, he's at downstate in Brooklyn, and I'm here, and we had uh, three of our children, all three were born in Brooklyn, so. So you're, you're really, you're really a Brooklynite at this point. Absolutely. Right? I feel very proud about that. Well, I, I am sure that uh, the hospital is happy to have you for so many years, all your experience and wisdom. And today we're going to share with our viewers a bit about hematology, the study of blood. We're going to talk today about sickle cell disease. And this is an important month, September. Tell us why. So, um, so one of the diseases that I treat is sickle cell disease because it's a hematological disorder. And uh, for years now, September has been uh, declared Sickle Cell Awareness Month because it's very important for people to know about sickle cell. I remember years ago when I was talking to a um, community person about sickle cell, they said, why are you talking about sickle cell? I thought it was gone. So it hasn't gone anywhere. It's very much there. And we should know that there are people with sickle cell disease living in the community. And it's very important for people to know what to, how to treat them, uh, you know, what complications they can get or how they can help them have a better life. So sickle cell, I, I've been working in Brooklyn as well for about 20 years now, and sickle cell is quite common here uh, in the borough. But I think the question that our viewers must have is, well, how do you get sickle cell? Or is this something that you're born with? Uh, you know, how do they know they have it? These are some of the very common questions I hear. Right. So when you, uh, in the, every person has blood in their body, and the blood has red blood cells. The normal red blood cells are shaped like a donut. And they carry oxygen, and they go in, you know, you take a deep breath, your blood cells, lungs get oxygen, the oxygen kind of diffuses into the red cells, and the red cells are, go throughout the body, and you get uh, oxygen to the body. But in sickle cell disease, the red blood cells, particularly when they are exposed to low oxygen or uh, dehydration, they become sickle-shaped or a C-shaped. And they, uh, two things happen to them. They're not able to, care. they break up very easily, and they don't carry enough oxygen, but they also break up very easily, and so the person becomes very anemic. And the other thing they do is they block up the blood vessels. And in 20 years ago, we would say very simplistically that they block the blood vessels and that's why the blood doesn't flow. It seems to cause complications in sickle cell disease. But now we know it's kind of local inflammation where the blood cells, along with all the other white cells, stick to the uh, blood vessel walls. So in smaller capillaries, it becomes hard for blood to flow. So these tiny little blood cells, which look like donuts, in sickler patient and sickle cell patients change their shape, change just their abnormal. Shape. Yes, and then they clog up or get stuck to the walls of right. the blood vessels. So, 
this is a disease that we can't catch, right? This is a disease okay. that we are born with. Absolutely. When, when is the first time in life that someone might have a hint that they have that they have sickle cell disease? So I have to tell you that in 1975, New York State was the first state to do newborn screening and add sickle cell disease to their to the list of six diseases that they diagnosed by newborn screening. So with those little dots of blood that you put on this little paper, filter paper, New York State is able to now, I think they are up to 40 different diseases that they can diagnose. But at that time, it was like six or seven diseases and one of them was sickle cell disease. So we get a notification because we are a comprehensive sickle cell center that a baby was born in your hospital or in this hospital that doesn't have a center saying that the baby has sickle cell disease. It's um, and they'll tell you what form, whether it's SS or SC or sickle thalassemia. And so then we call the family in and then we enroll the child in comprehensive care. So if they're here and, and lucky to be in one of our uh, centers here in Brooklyn, yes. a notification goes out to mom or, or the, and the parents will bring the baby yes, to you for an evaluation. Right. So you'll start seeing patients as newborns. Literally when they are two weeks old, when we get to know that they are, you know, they have sickle cell disease and we actually bring them in, tell them a little bit and we repeat the test because it's always nice to get confirmation. Right. And then we start them on antibiotics by the time they're about a month of age called penicillin because otherwise in the past when they did not get antibiotics and there was a whole study that was done you know in the 80s uh, it shows that they could get a higher incidence of meningitis and sepsis so these babies are put on antibiotics so it's, an, it, it's important to intervene early on in a, in a baby's life yeah. to prevent some of these side effects of sickle cell yeah newborn screening is essential because firstly families need to be educated and the babies need to, be, need to be started on penicillin. So you mentioned something about a comprehensive sickle cell center. Describe for the viewers what that means. What kind of a program is this? What do they look forward to seeing when they come into the center? So when, patient, when a child is diagnosed with sickle cell disease, the one thing that's very scary for parents is that this child is now going to be uh, followed, yes, by their pediatrician, but also by a hematologist for their whole life. And so it's very important for us, and I have a term that I always use, like for us to put our arms around the patient in the family, because you want to make them feel that they are in a place that where they'll be well taken care of. So one of the things we do is we actually make the parents very good advocates for themselves. We would tell them, if you go to the emergency room, make sure you tell the doctor that your child has sickle cell so that they know that if there is a fever, it needs to be taken care of right away. We teach them about the other complications because babies can get swollen hands and feet. And sometimes they go to the emergency room and people think that the baby, you know, got injured and it could be just a complication of sickle cell. So it's important for us to teach them. We teach them how to feel for the spleen so that the baby can, you know, otherwise babies can die of splenic sequestration. But then we teach families how to, mothers, how to palpate for the spleen. And we tell them about the different complications. They call us for everything. And that's just one aspect of comprehensive but That's care. important because this is building a foundation from, from birth. Absolutely. And holding their hands through this. It must be very, very uh, distressing for parents to learn about this if their, if their child has sickle cell. Absolutely. It's very, very distressing because the way you get sickle cell is both parents have to have a trait. And sometimes parents have a trait, but they do not realize the ramifications of having a trait of knowing that if you marry somebody else or you have a baby with someone with a trait, you could have a baby with the disease. Even though if say each parent has a trait, it's a one in four chance that they have a baby with the disease, but they don't realize that. So we, you know, in fact, when we diagnose trait babies, we tell them that the baby has trait and we give genetic counseling. But when, for some parents, it's a shock because they did not know they have the trait or they did not know the ramifications, and uh, it's very scary. So I'm sure, I'm sure. So it's nice to have a comprehensive center yes. uh, with One Brooklyn Health uh, system that allows parents of these babies to have the support they need yes. to get through the early years. We talk about sickle cell disease, we, uh, you know, in terms of the painful crises quite a bit, but there's many, many other issues that, right. that patients who have sickle cell disease need to look out for. 
What are some of the things that you educate your younger patients after they're beyond childhood and their teen years? Um, how, what do you educate them on preventative care? What, what do they need to do different than uh, the average person out there? Yeah. That's, that to me is such a great question because it's so important for children to know that when they go to school, they need to make sure they are well hydrated, they need to have extra bathroom privileges so that the uh, teacher doesn't think the child is just goofing off. And, uh, you know, to be able to explain if their eyes are yellow, that uh, this is not infectious, and to understand what uh, sickle cell is doing for them, to make sure that they dress well when it's cold, because a day like today, they could really come in with a crisis because they may not have a jacket on. Because what happens is when you're exposed to cold, your blood vessels could become, uh, you know, the, the vasoconstrict, you know, they become smaller and there's more chances for sickling and pain. The cells crises. can stick easier yeah, or stick easier. clog the little arteries. And the vessels, the capillaries are smaller right. and because there's vasoconstriction. And, the, and these are simple things for our viewers to understand that yes. patients with sickle cell need to look out for some of the simplest changes in the environment, whether it gets too cold, too hot, dehydration right. when they play sports. Exactly. Is, is there a limitation on contact sports with sickle cell patients because of the spleen being enlarged at a younger age? If the spleen is really very big, we actually uh, remove it. But most of the time when they are very young and the spleen is enlarged, they're not running around doing contact sports, but then it shrinks and actually loses its function. So for, a, for, a, for the most part, they become uh, asplenic. Uh, you know, because their spleen is not working. Yeah, I've had to explain this to some younger patients yeah. when they come in. We explain to them that the spleen is essentially no longer there. Right. And for our viewers early on in life, the spleen does enlarge. Right. And then Can. as time goes on, it shrinks in what we call auto splenectomy, right. which is you basically get rid of your own organ in a sense. Exactly. It, let's talk about that for a minute because uh, viewers who, who may know a little bit about sickle cell may know about the effects on the organs. When does that happen? How early in life or you know, when, when does that really happen that the spleen is essentially shrunken to, to disappear? Usually by about two years. Two years. Yeah. So are you worried about, uh, you know, you educate the patients about the larger spleen as a child. Um, are we worried about them playing? Are we worried about them doing anything out of the ordinary with, with young children or more, not? More than the worry about playing is the worry about getting a splenic sequestration crisis where the blood actually flows into the spleen. They almost bleed into the spleen, and that is a true emergency. I've had patients where mothers have called me in the middle of the night, they paged me, and I would call them back, and the mother who speaks just Spanish would say, my baby spleen mucho, and I would say, go to the emergency room right now, and I've had a young child whose hemoglobin was two. Because all the blood was, all the cooling, blood was cooling, storing itself in that spleen. Absolutely. And then as we move on, it, it disappears and, throughout and the disease. And before the 70s, 30% of kids with sickle cell disease would die because of splenic sequestration or infection. So the education and so early. Absolutely. That's, that's the key. And, and also meeting other parents with children really in support groups really makes a big difference. So we talk about the spleen. Another organ that I see a lot of in yes. my practice that gets affected is the gallbladder. Yes. Right. So almost 90% of them, by the time they are in their 20s, they have gallstones. So we don't usually take out the gallbladder. Yes, you are a gastroenterologist, so you must have seen a lot of that, I realize. We, we do. We yeah. see a lot of gallstones so, in patients with yeah. sickle cell. Sometimes it's causing an issue and other times it's not. It's not. And if it's not, we just wait it out because right. uh, you don't want them to, you know, have intrahepatic stones and, you know. Right. We, we talk about this a lot with the patients when they get a sonogram and Sometimes I've had some teenagers read it and they say, well, where is my spleen on the sonogram and why do I have gallstones? And I explain to them exactly <laughs> what you just right. told our viewers about the spleen and the gallbladder being involved in sickle right. disease. Another important point that you brought up is the social issues with um, sickle cell. And I've seen this again with younger patients. Their eyes are yellow sometimes, especially yes. as they go through crisis. And it's hard for patients of all ages probably to explain to people, I'm okay. Or, yeah. you know, this isn't... I don't have cancer, my, my liver is working. Why do, why do patients turn yellow? Why don't we explain that to them a little so, bit? So, remember I said when, uh, the, when the sickle cells are sickle shaped, they also break up very easily. So when your red cells break up, you release this pigment called bilirubin. 
and that bilirubin, there's only this much the liver can handle, and the excess bilirubin comes up in your, and it, it's jaundice, it's basically what lame, you know, in regular The yellowing of the eyes and skin that people yes. talk about. And most people associate this with cancer or alcoholics who have yes. liver disease, but it can occur in other diseases. Yeah, or infection, physical. like hepatitis. Right. They think. Right. So I've had like eight-year-old girl coming and saying, they, they call me an alien because my eyes are yellow right. and they say, you don't want to be with you. And it's so very hard. Very distressing it's for the younger very, patients. It's very hard. The next thing I've noted is that as they get older, especially at 18 years old, they're very educated on their disease. They're experts. They're no longer children, they've moved into yes. adulthood. They're experts on their disease. Unfortunately, they know so much about a disease because they've had to go through it. What can adults expect? Is there an impact on life expectancy? Is there an impact on what they can and can't do as adults? So, what should our, our older patients yeah. now think of? So our biggest problem in this country is when uh, patients with sickle cell disease become adults because um, there are not that many comprehensive sickle cell programs available. But I have to say that uh, in this, in the one Brooklyn Health, there is Interfaith Medical Center has a very good comprehensive adult program, and it also has a comprehensive pediatric program. We have a comprehensive pediatric program, and we have a good adult program where the same nurse who takes care of patients when they're younger also takes care of them when they're older. So there is this continuity. The biggest tragedy in this country in sickle cell is that when they become young adults they somehow fall out of care and the mortality rate actually takes a spike in their 20s. That's because of two reasons. One is some of them don't really um, are, are not very well capable of uh, you know um, advocating for themselves or and then they get lost in that uh, in the transition and uh, the other thing is the disease also sometimes does increase in severity, I think, at that time. So what we have is we have a transition program and we have it and Interfaith has it too. We do it together where we are, start educating the children as early as 12 and we start telling them about the disease. Because I never forget years ago there was this young 14 year old and I asked him, so what do you think sickle cell affects? And he said, I said, okay, like the red cell or the white cell? And then he said, the white cell? And my heart dropped. I felt so bad and I felt like, this is wrong. We need to educate our patients. So we do this on a consistent basis. We have a transition navigator who actually works with them. And then she also works with them when they are older uh, and goes over things like, what do you know about sickle cell disease? Evaluates their knowledge, but also teaches them uh, so that they start writing, what are the different things I can do to prevent a crisis? And when I have a crisis, what do I know about my insurance? What do I know about school? What if I go to college? When I go to college, who should I be talking to? How do I advocate for this? There's so much. It's a time. You, so this is sort of the this is like the safety net that you provide at a comprehensive care center. Is yes. that transition from childhood where maybe your parents are looking after you a bit yes. more, and you know no one cares more than mom and dad. But what is the treatment available? I, you know, in the past, in the past, we, we've just supported the patients, and you know, as a medicine resident, we would see sickle cell patients, and we would hydrate them and just wait for the crisis to break and give them pain medicines for the pain try to get their nutrition optimized. But is there something we can do now to treat the disease, prevent it from, from you know, getting into a crisis type stage for some patients? What can we do? Okay, so I just want to mention some of the complications before I tell you what sure. are the things we do. So they get uh, or painful crisis when they have pain all over their mm -hmm. body. And they can get something called acute chest syndrome where they get a, it looks like a pneumonia, but it's a sickle cell complication. They can get strokes. 10% of children with sickle cell disease get, can get strokes. But 20 to 30% of them can have a silent stroke where you wouldn't even know they've had a stroke, but you wonder why they're not doing so well in school anymore. And then, you know, the MRI will show that. And then they have, of course, as you mentioned, gallstones. They get kidney disease. They get leg ulcers. They have, um, they, they also have cardiac effects like pulmonary hypertension. So there are it affects, the blood goes everywhere in the it body and therefore 
the disease can Absolutely. affect everywhere in the body. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in terms of treatments, we give penicillin when the babies are born because that helps in preventing infections. We give it till they are five years of age. We give folic acid, which is a vitamin because the blood cells are breaking up. We also do a test called a transcranial Doppler, which is like an echo in the to measure the blood flow in the brain to show that if a child has a very fast blood flow, it might mean they are prone to strokes. And this was very clearly demonstrated in the 90s. How early do you do that in life? At age two. At age two, so early. We start at age two and we do it every year. Mm -hmm. And just a couple of weeks ago, we started a child and the treatment for that is transfusions. You give transfusions to prevent a stroke in children who are at high risk for a stroke. And then, so transfusion is one of the treatments. Uh, transfusion is also given when someone comes in with an acute complication, acute anemia, or splenic sequestration, acute chest syndrome. In addition, another, so that's why it's very important for the community to donate blood. It's very hard sometimes to find the right blood for sickle cell patients. So I'm going to put a pitch out there Very for people to, to donate blood. Supply the, the blood bank. Right. And they can require a number of, it's not just one transfusion, they can require a number of, of right. blood products. And, and many uh, pack red blood cells, but they need it frequently, or and some may not need it, but then some need it regularly if you've had a stroke or you had severe complications. Another treatment which is uh, which was first written up in 1995 was hydroxyurea. And hydroxyurea is an absolute game changer. I mean, it has changed the face of sickle cell in so many ways. People are so much better if they take it. And it's not as you, it should be given to or offered to every child with SS or sickle thalassemia because it really reduces the number of complications, increases the hemoglobin, makes them really do so well. And what age can you start that on hydroxyurea? Actually, there was a study called the Baby Hug Study by the NIH, and we could start that at even six months of age. So early on, there's treatment available you could. to help reduce the severity. Right. To re reduce the severity, and we offer it to families, and sometimes uh, families don't want to start that early, but if they get a significant complication, then we, we push, you know, the treatment. push the treatment yeah. because it's so important. So hydroxyurea was so many years ago, about four or five, four years ago, there was a new medication in which we had participated in the trials. It's called L-glutamine. It, uh, it's a powder and it's the canamina as a powder and that's uh, given and that can, that has also been um, used for, you know, approved for sickle cell disease. And last December, amazingly, there were two medications that were approved literally a week uh, from each other and they are uh, Adaptio, which was called Prazanlizumab and Voxelator, uh, where, you know, which is by mouth and Adaptio is an IV medication, really given to uh, prevent crisis. It's given monthly as an infusion and this other medication, Voxelator, which is by mouth, it ra ra raises the hemoglobin. So it, it's an exciting time for sickle cell over the last two years because there are so many new medications coming up. Now, our job is to make sure we use all the medications in our disposal to treat our patients. So for, so for the viewer watching today who might be home and has a diagnosis of sickle cell disease, hasn't seen a doctor for whatever reason, maybe they've been doing well for a while, this is an opportunity to let them know that there's new treatments out there to help prevent Absolutely. crisis. They need to check in with a comprehensive care center uh, like that at Brookdale. Absolutely. They really need to because it's not just pain management. And I don't want to I do want to mention that there is a cure for sickle cell disease. We've had about 14 patients who, who we have sent for a bone marrow transplant and they have been cured. You, basically the cure is a matched sibling. At least the ones that we've used is a matched sibling mm -hmm. uh, who does not have sickle cell disease, could have the trait or not be normal. And uh, if they have a HLA match, we have sent them for transplant as young as three, two, three years of age. So our viewers, to, to really explain what that is, is a bone marrow, trans a stem cell transplant. Yes. Which you have to have somebody who's a relative, so a sibling who really matches you. Yes. Genetically, so to speak. Um, explain how that's done. So basically in a transplant, what they do is 
they give you medications to kind of wipe out or uh, reduce the effect of your well, own delete, bone delete what your body has been delete doing. what your body has been doing and get the bone marrow from the donor and you do it by doing repeated bone marrows in the hips or sometimes you give a medication called to stimulate their stem cells which are the early cells and you put a special cord and take out those stem cells that's the you know easiest way to say this without so we're, uh, we're, we're taking out the, the, the old system that was in the body producing cells and putting in a new. Right. And when you put in the new, you just injected IV and it's like a homing pigeon. Those stem cells will go to the they mouth. They go and they flourish. And they should flourish. But all of this is dependent on how much the host accepts it and does not reject it. So there's immunosuppression and there's a lot. It's not just a quick not, fix, but there's a, a whole process to it. It is, yes. So for our viewers out there okay. today, we wanted to educate you on sickle cell. It is September, which is a month to remember sickle cell disease. And we went over the problems that our patients can face with sickle cell disease, some of the treatment options out there, and the experts that are available at a sickle cell comprehensive center here at the, Brooklyn, at the One Brooklyn Health System. Thank you for the interest in the show and your desire to become involved and educated. We invite you to visit our website at www.zurmed.com and check out our tools and connect with us on social media. Thank you, Dr. Vizwanathan, for joining us and talking about sickle cell disease to help our community and improve everyone's health. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.